This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where my guest is Will Johansson from Frog Life, a conservation group devoted to protecting amphibians and reptiles. Will's here to discuss practical ways we can support amphibians in our gardens, from building simple ponds to creating safe spaces where they can thrive. Will gives tips and advice to help you make a real difference for these often overlooked creatures. Frog Life is a, a national charity based in the UK, and our work basically kind of split into three work streams. So we're an amphibian and reptile conservation charity. Our work aims to transform lives, so work with communities, particularly in urban areas, to try and do something about amphibians and reptiles and their habitats, and help enable people to protect those habitats, understand more about those species. We work to transform landscapes, so we engage in habitat work. So a lot of our work revolves around ponds, whether that's making ponds, maintaining ponds, generally being in and around ponds, and also transforming research. So we have a research arm as well, which looks into amphibian and reptile conservation in the UK, but also into the effects of our work on, on communities. And I work for Frog Life Discovering Geo Ponds Project, and we're a national lottery heritage fund funded project based in Sussex in the southeast of England. I work mostly in Brighton, but we kind of, we work across the sort of East and South Downs area. And the project is kind of like Frog Life's work split into engaging with communities. So we work a lot in, in urban areas in, in Brighton and also in restoring habitats. And the project's three years, or it's been three years actually. So we're nearing the end of the project now. It started in September, 2021, and it ends in November this year. So in about a month and a half at the time of recording. So kind of, yeah, at the end of the Discovering Geocons project. Oh, I mean, it sounds like a good project. So just kind of taking it back to basics, you mentioned amphibians and reptiles. Can you tell me the difference between them? Very good question. So amphibians and reptiles are kind of evolutionarily slightly closely related. There are hundreds of millions of years separating them, but they both have cold blood. To many people, they look quite similar. Amphibians don't have scales, so reptiles have kind of scaly skin which keeps moisture inside their bodies. And for that reason, reptiles are quite good at tolerating quite dry environments. So often you find reptiles kind of in the subtropics, so desert-like environments. Um, actually, the UK and in kind of Western Europe isn't a hotspot for reptile diversity in the world because they're really a tropical or subtropical group of species. And so reptiles don't always live near water. They give birth to live young or they lay eggs and the eggs don't need to be laid in water. Amphibians are a bit different. Amphibians depend on water or, or moist environments for their survival. And in the UK, we've got seven native amphibian species. They all lay their eggs, or we call it spawn, in the case of protein toads, in water. And they develop part of their life in water and then they emerge as adults after a few months, usually, or not so they emerge as kind of fully formed juveniles after a few months and then return to the water to breed in a few years' time. So amphibians really depend on, on water. Amphibians can also, they don't have that kind of scaly, tough skin. They can breathe through their skin, so they can take oxygen through the skin, particularly when the skin is wet. They do have lungs as adults, but actually young, you'll know, sort of tadpoles. They swim around in the water, they come up to the surface occasionally, but they're able to breathe through their skin. And actually young newts are able to breathe not only through their skin, but also they've got external gills. So a bit like fish, but kind of they stick out, they're external and they can breathe through those gills. So amphibians kind of adapt to kind of wet habitats, basically, whereas reptiles can tolerate drier conditions. So seven species of amphibians, actually not that many, surprisingly. How many species of reptiles do we have that are indigenous to the UK? Well, we've got six major species of reptiles, so also not that many. And we've got seven if we count the leatherback fossil, which is a marine species. But that's probably like our clinical station work on these terrestrial or land-based species. So seven amphibians and then only six reptiles. So it's kind of similar. We're not a hotspot for amphibian or reptile diversity, but... The species we have got are incredibly charismatic and precious because we don't have that many. I think it's even kind of more important to think about their conservation and their role in the landscape, which is kind of oversized for how little species they are. They play a massive role in our environment and, and yeah, deserve their habitats being cared for. Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about that, are there any particular population trends for all of the species that you kind of look after? Or are there, for example, any that are particularly at risk? Yeah, it's also a really good question. So as with many species in the UK, not just reptiles and amphibians, they experience declines. 
particularly in the last 50 years. So it's hard to know exactly because the species groups aren't incredibly well studied compared to some species. But we do have some figures on some amphibian, but on native amphibian species. So common toads are estimated to be in decline. And they're quite a ubiquitous species in the UK. Most people know about common toads and a few people have kind of seen them in gardens. They're often present in urban areas. But they've experienced massive declines, especially in the last 30 years. So it's estimated that common toads in the UK declined by 68% between 1986 and 2016. So that's really concerning for a number of reasons, and we think we've got a good idea of why that's taking place. So in the case of common toads, it's kind of a mix of habitat loss, so they need kind of good quality breeding ponds, good quality areas to forage for food and overwinter, and often that's in gardens. But also their habitat's really fragmented, it's really separated by features in the landscape that just weren't there or weren't as well used, or as, for example, a road maybe that was used. So a limited capacity 30 years ago has suddenly become quite busy, and that means any toads crossing that road are potentially face danger of doing their crossings. So toads, particularly, they kind of a case study in how amphibians are actually quite vulnerable to our activities and have shown declines. With reptiles, again, the, the research isn't extensive, but it's quite clear that reptiles, some reptiles species particularly, are in decline. So the adder, which is a also quite an iconic species, and many people know what an adder is, not people have seen them because they're quite secretive. But adders are finding that habitat quite fragmented in, in, in our project area. So in, in around Brighton and the South Downs, adders aren't really present in Brighton or in the fringes of Brighton. If you go out a bit further into the South Downs, you do get populations, but those populations are often quite isolated. So they're often from small patches of habitat. And that creates problems because the adders can't easily get between those patches of habitat. So eventually, if that habitat was to be lost, that small population might be lost. So yeah, the situation isn't great for amphibians and reptiles in the UK, and there are other threats which compound that habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. So things like disease, disturbance by people, that kind of thing. So yeah, the picture isn't great. So it's concerning, and it's especially concerning because we don't have entirely clear kind of research on exactly which species are declining at at which rate. So we've got a kind of the best idea, but we don't have a a, a kind of clear picture. So it it could easily be a bit worse than we actually know it to be at the moment. That is just terrifying. Those statistics are very sobering, I have to say. Obviously, this is a gardening podcast. And one of my concerns is how gardens can help to slow down the rates of decline. But I am also concerned about the wider environment. But focusing on gardens, are there things that we can do to help support both amphibians and reptiles? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a really important message that people do really effective actions to help these species. Also, not no matter how much space you've got. So even if you've got a big garden or something quite small or just like a local green space that you're involved with the management of, so maybe a park or, or maybe a school, there's a lot you can do. So we've mentioned seven native amphibian species, and actually about four of those some are found in gardens, so quite a high percentage of species will live in gardens. And with reptiles, about three to six species are found in gardens. So the species are there, potentially, but encouraging them is important. And we're a bit biased because we're probably, but we think a pond is like the best thing you can do in a garden for biodiversity, and it has to be really good for amphibians also. So creating a pond of any size, A wildlife pond is just a great thing you can do. It not only provides that wet breeding habitat for amphibians and and, and shelter for them in dry periods, but also it provides for other species like dragonflies, water beetles, water boatmen, provides a drinking source for other wildlife, so for for flying insects, foxes, badgers, you name it, ponds are kind of going to attract a lot of the wildlife that's living in the areas. So ponds are fantastic. Um, We talked about amphibians losing habitat as well, and it's thought the Freshwater Habitats Trust, which is a great charity that does a lot of work so on conservation as well as other freshwater habitats in the UK, estimated that about 50% of the ponds were lost in the UK in the 20th century. So we've lost lots, and a lot of that loss has taken place in gardens. So just kind of restoring a network of wildlife ponds in gardens, that's a really important step we can take, and that would massively benefit common frogs, common toads, and newts as well. So snake newts, palmate newts, and in some cases, you get really lucky, great crested meats will, will come into gardens. So wildlife ponds is, is kind of the message that we really get behind. And in terms of managing your garden, and I'm thinking about compost heaps, and I'm thinking about leaving areas undisturbed, are there other things that we can be doing that would benefit these creatures? Yeah, massively. So, well, ponds are kind of flagship for 
good in conservation within a small space, and you can just have any water. That's fantastic. It's often looked over, but amphibians need that terrestrial land habitat as well. So the different species, it varies how much time they spend on land, but approximately across the species in the UK, they spend about two thirds of their life on land. So having cover for them on land is really important. So shelter and amphibians, they're breeding in the spring and they're emerging from the ponds after breeding and the young are emerging sort of later in the summer after developing in the pond. And while they're on land during the summer and the late summer months, they're feeding, so feeding on small invertebrates, worms, slugs and snails, which is great if you've got a garden, if you've got lots of slugs and snails, amphibians can help. So if you've got areas of shelter where they can kind of hide away from potential predators, from extreme weather, so if it's really hot, so we've had some hot summers, not so much this year, in the last couple of years, areas of kind of cover, so like long grass, wildflower patches, you mentioned compost heaps are fantastic, particularly open compost heaps, and even if you've got a closed compost heap, just having a pile of leaves next to the compost heap is a fantastic option for providing cover, that's really important. As well as sort of sheltering while foraging for food, amphibians typically overwinter on land. So it's not a true hibernation, but they're not completely dormant, but they'll kind of slow them and tuck them down and stop feeding over the winter. And they need somewhere ideally dry, but doesn't flood basically, but also doesn't get too cold during the really cold months, kind of rest and, and hide away. And that's really important to have those other spaces as well. So we often encourage people to build log piles to provide that. Often tones will overwinter under sheds and other things. So they'll kind of choose anywhere, but having those spaces and that provide shelves from the elements and other things it's really important. You mentioned obviously about the amount of time they spend on land. I think that sometimes people think that if they see a frog or a toad, it needs to be in a pond, but that doesn't sound like that's correct then. Yeah, that's also a really good point. Often when they're on land, but that's a choice they've made. And ideally, unless it's in danger, we'd recommend not moving it. So situations where you might move it might be if you're for mowing the lawn, that kind of thing, and you've found a frog and it's in the way, in which case maybe it's somewhere sheltered is recommended, or maybe if you're driving along and you see a toad on the road and it's in danger, we'd recommend moving it down. But actually, whenever you're moving amphibians, if you found them on land, it's best just to put them somewhere sheltered on land. So frogs and toads, especially when you really visit the pond, for sustained periods in, in the spring and moving them somewhere nice and cozy on land where they've been hiding into a pond, although they'll probably tolerate it, it's a bit of a shock to them because they've kind of they've chosen to be on land at that point. So it's yeah, it's really recommended to either leave them be or if they're in danger, just move them somewhere else that's kind of hidden away but, but on land. There's a few important things I want to pick up on that. So thinking about moving or picking up frogs and toads. Again, I have read that picking up toads and frogs can actually cause them damage. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so they've got really sensitive skin. So it's recommended, unless you really have to, to not pick them up for a number of reasons. So we often carry chemicals on our hands without knowing. Even soap residue can potentially harm their skin. A temperature difference between our hands and the environment they'd be in might also harm them. So they're cold blooded, but if we've got really warm hands, it might give them a bit of a shot or potentially cause them pain. So it's recommended if you have to pick them up either to wear like gardening gloves or to dip your hands in some, some non-tap water, so some rainwater or a puddle or anything like that. Just make sure your hands are kind of moist and also make sure your hands are kind of you wash up any potential harmful residue. So yeah, we actually, we help out with them. Um, there's a toad patrol up the road, which is like a kind of crossing point for toads when they're like boating in the spring. And when I've not had gloves on, I've just sort of done my hands in a puddle before picking them up and giving them a little rinse. And that's a, a, a method of colour, which was nothing I wanted on my hands before. And also that my hands are quite moist so that it doesn't dry before I'm missing out. And also they can be quite wriggly and get away from you. Is there a danger that if you held them at a particular height, they could actually hurt themselves if they jumped? away from you yeah it's a really good point they don't know you're trying to help them so they often try and jump away so yeah it's not recommended for that reason especially if you're carrying them a bit of a distance they can just hop out and although frogs are particularly known for the jumping toes can hop as well and will sometimes make a bit of a break and you don't need to have them really hard in the air if you can if you've got a bucket for hand that's quite a good method so you can tra- transport them maybe from one side of the garden to the other to get them out of the way if you are mowing the lawn just a bucket would be quite a good idea. Then you can kind of make sure it's not going to jump out of the bucket while you're carrying it along. Excellent advice. And you did mention the roads. And I have to say, I am traumatised by a couple of driving incidents at night where I've seen toads crossing the road and there's just been, it's been devastation and it's awful. 
what can people do to help that? Because it's horrendous to witness. Yeah, no, it really is. So Frog Ice, that helps to coordinate a network of volunteer tow patrols across the UK. And the coverage is quite good. So there's usually a tow patrol within about 10 miles of most of the UK, particularly England. And what you can do is go on Frog Ice website, which is froglife.org. There's a section on the website called Toads on Road. So, and you can actually find a map of tow patrols in your area. You can then click on the icon on the map and get in touch with the patrol coordinator. Tow patrols go out in the spring, so usually tow breeding season is kind of February, March time. And you go out on kind of wet evenings, warm from the summer year, but it's usually about eight degrees and you help them across roads. It's a fantastic thing to do and volunteer patrols always need other people and other enthusiastic people helping. If there's no patrol set up near you, but you know there's a towed crossing point, so toads are quite loyal about where they breed and often they're following the same ancestral migration routes back to the ponds they were born in. So it's typical that toads will cross roads at the same point every year, the same location every year. So if you know of one of those locations, it's really good to let Bob Love know in case there's an opportunity to set up a tow patrol there. And if you've got the time on evenings in the early spring and you're willing to, to do that, then we're always looking for new patrol coordinators to kind of set up patrols where we don't have existing coverage. So yeah, it's an amazing network of volunteers that do all the patrolling. And yeah, it's really fantastic. It's really rewarding to do, especially because of how difficult it is when you're doing house toys crossing road, you know, there's nothing being done to protect them. So um, yeah, it's really empowering, really recommended to get involved with your local tow patrol if you can. Absolutely. I think that's a really valuable initiative. And the other question I get asked a lot about ponds, actually, is can frogs and toads and their spawn coexist with fish? Yeah, also a really good question. So in some cases, simply with common toads, which carry a toxin from spawn to adulthood, so spawn tadpoles and adults all carry a toxin called bufotoxin, and that puts fish and most other predators off eating them. So toads are okay at coexisting with fish. Um, typically toads also breed in bigger, deeper ponds, which just are more likely to have fish in them. Fish will also occasionally go for toads, I pass particularly large fish like tart, but smaller fish like goldfish and, and sticklebacks, which kind of come naturally in, in lots of ponds and ditches, aren't so fond of toad spawn and tadpoles. Frogs aren't so good at coexisting with fish. Often fish will just kind of fever up frog spawn. Unless it's a really big pond where the frogs have spawned in kind of a nice like shallow area on the edge of the pond away from the fish. So typically we advise not to introduce fish to a pond. Many people have fishing ponds already though. And if that's the case, it's often worth just building another pond, even something small, even kind of a, a trug like bucket buried in the ground may encourage frogs to spawn there instead of spawning in the fish pond. So you know, fish they're interesting in their own right and a nice fish to have in ponds, but often Having fish not only depletes the amphibian population that could be breeding in that pond, but also fish will eat invertebrates and interesting the range of pond invertebrates you, you might otherwise see if you didn't have them. So yeah, fish aren't recommended, although if you've got fish, think about building another small pond nearby and that might encourage the insect to move in and breed in the garden. And actually that brings us on neatly to another thing that I was going to ask you, which gets mentioned occasionally in sort of wildlife circles, and that is, I'm assuming it's not a good idea to move frog spawn from one place to another. Yeah, so we recommend not to for a number of different reasons, but the main reason is disease risk. So common frogs in particular, they suffered from a disease called ranavirus in the UK. We've seen outbreaks catching the southeast over the last couple of decades and, and with some detrimental consequences. So the disease can be transferred through moving spawn around. And we often like to say if you build a pond and if you have frogs in the area, over time they, they will find the pond and they will find a way, which is often like a really rewarding process if you haven't introduced spawn and you've just got a wildlife pond that you set up. It's amazing when amphibians do colonise that pond. So it's recommended not to be spawned because of disease risk, but also enjoy the process of seeing what comes to the pond and what finds it. Funny you should say that because we put a pond in where I work and kept excitedly checking it to see what would turn up. And then one day this not the most attractive frog stuck its head out of the water and actually the first arrival was a marsh frog. Ah. <laughs> I know that's not going to be a problem for everyone in the UK, but certainly in our neck of the woods, it's a thing. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, marsh frogs, they're present around us as well in our kind of project area. I think they were introduced in like the late 
19th century and they've kind of been helped on the way there by people in the meantime. And they're quite annoying thing, a bit bigger than some of the frogs. Pretty amazing to see one anyway, but yeah, potentially not the most viable frog species to have in, in a garden pond. No, possibly not. But anyway, it's here and it's here to stay, I'm sure. So just to wrap up, is there anything, apart from the toad patrol and mindfully maintaining your garden, which a lot of people who listen will do, is there anything else that you would recommend to help frogs and toads and on all the rest of the amphibians and reptiles along their way? How can we best help? Yeah, I think, yeah, just like wildlife ponds, again, that's fantastic. Even something really small, and you might be surprised about what breeds in there. But terrestrial habitats and having connectivity between ponds and those terrestrial habitats, so thinking about a pond not in isolation, but as a habitat that's well linked up to things like compost beaks and log piles. And, and that might be linking it up by having patches of long grass or having a border nearby with some low shrubs that provides cover. And but thinking about connectivity in your garden, but also kind of on a wider scale as well. So if you can encourage neighbours to do even something small, just to kind of help provide stepping stones away from your garden into other habitats. So encourage neighbours maybe to have just a tiny pond of a little bucket or some little patch of grass that doesn't get mown during the summer. But also maybe thinking about improving access to your garden. So if you've got wooden fences, thinking about creating like a small hole at the bottom of your wooden fence, even a couple of inches across will allow common tones to move through and like other amphibian species, as well as species like hedgehogs as well, which would be amazing to have in the garden and would also benefit from those things like log piles and compost heaps. And thinking kind of on a bigger picture, if you can support a frog life project locally, we're always incredibly grateful for volunteer support and all just interest in our project. So frog life works across the UK and runs projects in London, in Somerset, in Birmingham and in Scotland. And it's worth taking a look at our website and looking for a project near you that you might be able to get involved with. While you're on the website, there's loads of resources about making habitats in gardens so there's a section on the website called wildlife at home and on there there's a list of different habitat interventions that you can do in your garden from log piles to ponds etc and also a publication that, that frog life provide called just add water and that's a guide to creating and maintaining wildlife ponds which is also on the website so we would recommend going and having a look on the website and finding more about what you can do in your own green space but also with a, with a project near you that you can get involved with thank you very much to will for the interview and for all the good work Frog Life do to look after our reptiles and amphibians. And thanks to you for listening. If you like this episode, I recommend checking out episode 292, Spiders, and episode 303, Slugs and Snails. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website, rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.